The logo for the Kansas State School for the Blind, a flying blue eagle in the center of a red and yellow sunflower. KSSB presents White Cane Day Kickoff, a virtual Zoom roundtable featuring guest speaker, Mr. Timothy Hornick. This video has audio description and captions. The camera view alternates between the co-hosts, Lydia and Gabe, and the guest speaker, Timothy Hornick. Lydia and Gabe are seated in the Kansas State School for the Blinds Library with KSSB students. Tim is seated in a room in front of a Chicago Bears wall sign and a mountain bike wheel. Welcome to KSSB's White Cane Day kickoff because White Cane Day is not actually today, but we're kicking off the week leading up to Saturday. Um, and we're pleased to have our guest, Mr. Tim Hornick with us. Really quickly, my name is Lydia Knopp. Hello, I'm new at KSSB and I'm honored to be co-hosting um, White Cane Day kickoff discussions. And I also have a a student. Gabe, can I have you introduce yourself and what grade you're in and a little bit about you? Well, I'm Gabe. I'm a senior here at uh, KSSB. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I'm about to turn 18. I don't really know what to say about myself, but <laughs> that's a brief introduction. That's all good. That's all good. So um, between myself and Gabe, we'll be your co-host today, but we know you're really here to hear um, from our guest speaker. So um, Mr. Timothy Hornick is the Director of Special Initiatives at the Blinded Veterans Association. He is a social worker at Caddis. He resides in Lawrence with his wife and two daughters, and Tim enjoys endurance and adaptive sporting adventures where he combines his love for the outdoors with technology. So welcome, Tim. If you don't mind giving us a brief intro of White Cane Day, and then, uh, take it away, Tim. No problem. I appreciate everyone for having me on board. As uh, stated, my name is Tim Hornick. And before getting things started with just what is White Cane Day, is that nice introductory and uh, history of it, uh, let's go and do a shout out over to Michael Byington, who, if you actually need to know the actual truth and not just the glossed over <laughs> stuff of what I'm about to uh, briefly cliff note, just ask Mike. He knows this history like no one else because, well, he's a legend within our field as well as within our community that helped get all of this started. So I just want to say thank you, Mike, for everything that you've done with making this all a reality here in the state of Kansas and throughout the entire country because I don't know anyone or everyone here is fully well versed on what your accomplishments have been over your life. So thank you, Mike. Um, so to start things off, a little trivia question is, who can tell me the precise uh, Kansas statute that talks about White Cane Safety Day? We don't have any takers in, in this room. <laughs> no one? Oh, come on. I think we're going to have some people have to recycle their, uh, their uh, you know, their Kansas history then. Um, so if you're ever looking to see where this is covered, because in order for us to talk about White Cane Safety Day, we have to understand that this is actually encoded in law, both at the national level and the state level. So within the state, it's, uh, you can find it within the statutes for KSA 39-1104. In fact, the entire 39-1100 series, that's 1100 through 1113 is all about blindness, visual impaired, but 04 is in particular related to just White Cane Day as we celebrate it here in Kansas. As a person with a visual impairment, when we walk, when sighted people, they talk about putting their best foot forward to take their steps forward. With us, we don't just put our best foot forward, we put our best foot forward plus our white cane forward. For that is how we go forward. That is the representation of us as individuals with visual impairments. Everyone is able to recognize what the white cane is throughout the world and that it is a symbol for us to regain independence. It's a symbol for us to navigate everything that we are navigating through. It is our guide. It is our beacon. It is what we use to go forward and venture forward into life. And 
even if you don't use a white cane and you use a guide dog or something else, this is still what we use to go forward as we advance and venture forward into life. So this is why October 15th is especially meaningful for us who are visually impaired to go ahead and think about our history about the white cane, about where it came from, its roots, and how it came to where we are today as being that iconic symbol for our disability. Because let's face it, since humans incurred sight loss, there's been some form of cane, staff, or other type of instrument that's been used for our travel to help guide us, to help move us forward. Because this is how we detect obstacles. This is how we figure out what's in front of us. And this is just what we use to go, to go and venture forth. Now, the actual white cane and that development as we commonly see it today, all that started back in World War I with those individuals that were returning from the front lines. A lot of them have had development of visual impairments from concussive blasts to mustard gas to a variety of other conditions. And from there, a couple of organizations, uh, most notably Blind Veterans of the United Kingdom is what they're known as today, as well as the Red Cross started to look at ways for individuals to start to develop independence with their visual impairment. So back then it was common for folks to use things like a, a broomstick to mm -hmm. go and develop that into a cane to help them with their navigational travel. Other common tips and tech, tricks and techniques is that people were using strings and wrapping that around houses or rehab facilities or place of employment and just a bunch of other things just to help us be able to navigate those situations. Well, that actually did begin to catch on where we started to see more and more people looking at a cane technique that eventually became a white cane in the late 1920s and 1930s that started to really gain prevalence. And we had it in the early 1930s, kind of that initial development of a white cane and what we commonly now call the two-tap technique. Uh, began to develop and show its way within medical research and rehabilitative research. But where we actually got to see it beginning to come into its uh, true state that the white cane is today is going to be in the 1940s, 1943 to 1946 and 1947, where uh, Warren Bledsoe as well as uh, Richard Hoover were the ones that began to develop the two-tap technique as we do know of it today with the returning veterans from World War II based on research that they were tasked to do by FDR because there was concerns that with the conflicts arising in Germany and the Pacific theater that we're gonna have another onslaught of visual impairments uh, coming back and we needed to have a good rehabilitative system in play. So that's where this research began to develop within the uh, War Department, eventually over in the VA and eventually throughout the greater community of rehabilitative uh, locations that work with individuals with visual impairments. Wow. So eventually it all took on to the point where we are at where we are today, where back in 1964, uh, LBJ uh, passed the first bit of legislation that kind of encapsulated October 15th as White Cane Safety Day. And this is what we have been celebrating ever since then. So White Cane Day has a great uh, history. There's been some great books and documents uh, created that you could go and learn more about this. On uh, NLS Bard, you got the uh, Journey Select Excellence, the development of the VA's blind rehab system. Dr. Uh, Greg Goodrich uh, published an article that's available in the Journal of Blind and Visually Impaired back in 2019 that highlights everything that occurred between World War I to World War II, uh, which is where I grabbed some of these information. So that's kind of the brief synopsis of what White Cane Day is, where it came from, and how we got to where we are today, which is a very awesome day to think of, that it's the one day that recognizes us for who we are and how we travel. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that background. Um, I personally didn't know the history, and I'm curious if there will be a pop quiz after this conversation. Oh, uh, we're hearing grunts from the school. Gabe, did you know this information? 
Briefly. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> not as in depth. So we're getting exactly. some really awesome <laughs> history as we lead up to this Saturday. So um, shifting gears a bit, Tim, would you mind sharing a bit about your background um, and a bit about your story of vision loss? No problem. So my story of vision loss is like all of our stories of vision loss, it's unique to ourselves. The way that we have our vision, what we're able to see or not see or kind of see or some combination of all that, it is all based on us as individuals. And mine is no different where uh, mine uh, occurred due to a injury I sustained uh, while over in um, combat operations in Iraq. And it rendered me completely blind from the time of the injury. However, some of it was able to be restored where I was able to have a, uh, enough usable vision so that I could be dangerous to, well, myself, uh, because I was pretending like I did not have a visual impairment. I was trying to be the sighted blind guy, which is only so effective at getting me in trouble or running into things, uh, which is just one of the hard parts with our visual impairments for those of us that incurred at some point in time in our lives is adjusting to that. Just what can we do to live with it? What can we do to understand it? And more importantly, what can we do to accept our visual impairment? And that was one of my biggest uh, hurdles I had to overcome is accepting myself for who I was with my visual impairment as I was working alongside my sighted peers. And it's just one that I still deal with from time to time on a regular basis based on different <laughs> situations. But ultimately, it's something that I have come to terms with in my own light over the uh, years to understand that I am proud to have my visual impairment because it is who I am. It has shaped the person that I have become. And it doesn't matter if it's a good day or a bad day. It's one that it's part of me. It's I can't separate it. I can't separate my visual impairment from myself, just like I can't separate my name from who I am. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and a little, a little backstory, I think is always helpful. So um, moving forward, how did life change after becoming blinded? Um, is there any initial struggles or challenges? Um, you know, if you if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah. maybe anything you're willing to share about that. Yeah, and I, I think one of the biggest struggles and uh, you know, a good, good uh, selection of uh, the folks here will come to understand this is um, when you're beginning to move into uh, higher levels of education, employment, and those type of situations where you know, those worlds are predominantly set up for decided individuals and you're trying to fit us as a, uh, well, I would, I would call the side of the world the square peg or the square hole, and we're the round pegs trying to get squeezed into it. And sometimes it doesn't work. And it's learning to figure out how do we fit into those areas? What can we do to uh, best situate ourselves? And for me, a lot of that just had to do with learning technology because I love computers. I've been building computers since my teens. And that's been a few, a few years, by the way. Um, yeah, anyways. So I've been, I've been in around computer technology for a very long time. Um, back in the early days of, you know, there's an operating system before Windows 95 uh, to give any type of um, historical reference point. But that's when you start, that's when I started learning. That's when I started to figure out how all this stuff comes together. And so it's harnessing my strength, which was computers and technology. That's one of the ways that I was able to stay in the military for seven years after losing my sight is that I harnessed my love for computers. I, the one piece of technology I did use on a regular basis, even though I didn't use my cane at all for about five years, because I didn't want people to know that I was blind, is that I did use my adaptive software, um, mainly JAWS, uh, with, with, him, with my computer, because it was something I was able to control and something I was able to use. I understand that that does not work for everyone, and it didn't always work for me, which is then learning to be adaptable and to see, okay, so this solution does not work, what solution might work? And for me, it's been exploring just all those possibilities with my peers, with uh, folks that are professionals in the field, trying to see, hey, here's the problem that I'm having, uh, how do I overcome it? Overcome it? And within the technology field, this is where I have this great um, 
evolutionary expanse of learning just what is out there. So moving from JAWS and workplace environments to using mass because it flows with me better and just harnessing all of those capabilities that each of these systems understand their strengths and their weaknesses and then employing them so that it fits me. Now, I understand that technology might not be a suitable solution for everyone, uh, regardless of your age or demographic, because technology, well, it's a, it's a love-hate relationship. Um, uh, oh, God. <laughs> Some grumbles from our crowd in here. Back. I don't know how, how you guys <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, so one is like how many people end up having to explain how to use our technology with other folks, especially your sighted, your family, uh, your peers and other folks around you. How many, how many of y'all spend time doing that on a regular basis? We've got some, got some hand raised. Yep. In, in the room here. Yeah. And, and these are examples of self-advocacy where it's like as much as we go and harumph that we see all the time we have to do, it's like, okay, now it's time to explain what this thing has done. And yes, I know the chipmunks are talking in the background. Y'all get used to it. <laughs> um, but this is just how we just need to adapt and some of the things that we need to overcome. And more importantly, before we're able to get to that stage, as I said, I'm going to say this many times. First, we have to accept this as part of ourselves because it is us. This is how we interact. This is who we are. Um, using our canes, uh, how many people find it as they're walking around and say they're going over to Starbucks or something and they just, you know, tap their cane into the uh, heel, shins or other uh, lower leg extremities of people in front of us and they look back and say, what, you blind? And it's like, yeah, can't you tell? <laughs> I mean, yeah. this, is who, this is who we are and it's, it's be comfortable with ourselves and our skin. As I said, for me, this took a number of years before I was comfortable with myself in my skin. But once I got there, oh yeah, I had fun with it nowadays. Um, <laughs> I, no, I'm not saying I intentionally do it in all situations, but yeah, I'm definitely intentionally doing it in some situations. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I hope we hear some of that throughout the rest of this conversation too. Oh, y'all will. I got those stories. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for sharing uh, your background, your story, uh, and your, uh, you know, thoughts. Can I get Richard's question really quickly? I only got part of it. Yeah, um, we have a question in the chat. Have you ever accidentally apologized at inanimate objects when you're walking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and here's a fun thing that kind of probably puts me on the more militant side of the spectrum is that I'm at the point right now where I gave up apologizing for who I am. And I, I know this kind of, as I said, this puts me on a different spectrum on how, on how I view myself, and how I interact with the world. Um, so at one point in time, yes, I would apologize to those wonderful street signs, uh, posts and other things. <laughs> Just like sometimes we find ourselves talking to no one because the person left us. Uh, and did to tell us that they were leaving. So great story later, I'm still talking, they're gone. Someone comes up and says, who are you talking to? Like <laughs> myself, of course. Um, but, so this is one that, as I said, it's um, at one point in time I used to, nowadays um, I'm, it's, it's who I am. So it's like, I don't apologize for me being me as much as it's, you know, un unless something majorly happens for the most part, it's, Hey, no problem. You're all good. Move on. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Well, um, we have a couple questions for you. I'm going to toss it over to my co-host, Gabe, to hit yeah. you with a couple of the first ones. All right. Well, my first question is, with your preference of travel, do you prefer traveling with a cane or do you use a guide dog? Okay. So I absolutely love my black furry cane that I use all the time. <laughs> He is ridiculously adorable black lab named Barney that's been with me now for uh, seven and a half years. And it's, yeah, I, I prefer him over a cane. But again, there's a big long story and background between cane, cane travel and guide dog travel. These are two completely different methods of us interacting with the world and traveling. And one does not work for others and vice versa. So with cane and 
all of y'all com folks will appreciate this, <laughs> is that with a cane, what you're trying to do is detect the objects so that you can navigate off those objects. With the dog, you're avoiding those objects. And for me, it's like, I prefer avoiding the objects, which is why I love guide dog travel. Whereas some yeah. folks, you know, they'll flip that and say, you know, they love being able to detect the objects so they know where they are. So then they'll stick with the cane. And even some folks that started with a dog and now is back to using the cane, it's based on who you are, what you need, what it is that you are most comfortable and familiar with that's going to be successful. So me, I love dogs. They're cute, they're cuddly, they're adorable. They're a great uh, interaction piece. The one little caveat I will give with dogs is most people do not realize that I have a visual impairment, which makes a lot of my interactions with folks quite interesting when they realize that uh, the puppy at my side is guiding me and not just there for another purpose. So <laughs> that does bring up a few different situations that if you're using a wet cane, more people are going to recognize, oh, gotcha, visual impairment, check, moving on. Uh -huh. <laughs> The symbol in a way that the cane versus a dog can be a lot of other things, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I have another one. What means of technologies do you use? What forms of it? If it is something that goes beep and talks nice and fast, I use it. So <laughs> my, my preference on technology is the uh, newly developed. So everyone knows what AT is, right? Mm -hmm. Did anyone okay. tell me actually all three? Uh, all three sense. definitions of A in the word AT. There's three of them. It's not one. Anybody got it? There's I got access, it. Access, accessible, and what's the third one? Or nope. No. It's nope. It, it's access, assistive, and assistive adaptive. And adapt right. There we go. Okay, okay I should have known that because uh, you took the class. <laughs> I no, I helped co-teach the class. <laughs> okay. There you go. So my, my favorite type of technology are those items known as the uh, accessible technology. Those are the mainstream devices that have built that are designed with universal design principles. So they are used for everyone. And the reason why I love those the best is I can go on anyone's device, be able to hop on a few uh, toggles of a uh, of an accessibility switch, and I'm using it like no one's business. Um, not to say there's nothing against the assistive technologies and the, uh, and the, um, yeah, I'm going to kick myself in the butt because I forgot the other one. Uh, adaptive. Thank you. Yeah, the bolt-on one, the uh, tinkers. Yes, adaptive are the tinkers out there. Um, yeah, it's nothing against those. It's just my personal, it's just my personal preference are those items that's the mainstream devices that has features that we all can use to make it usable for us. Now, the fun part is the why for that. I have to teach my parents, my kids, my <laughs> wife, the people I work with, how to use their devices way yeah. too often. <laughs> so, oh, that's sad. <laughs> so are, you, are you actually serious? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I know. I've I've been there. I can definitely attest to it. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. I I mean I've taught my sighted folks at work how to use Microsoft Teams. Wow. <laughs> um, I am my family's hub for everything related to Apple products. It doesn't matter who they are. They come to me. I'm the one that teaches my daughter how to use her Chromebook for school. So it's, it's, yeah, but it's only because they are accessible for everyone that I'm able to do this, which is why it's my favorite device. Wow. Okay. So what, what, what are your favorite hobbies? Ah, now here, here comes the fun part. So hobbies, um, unfortunately I, I, I don't have the full view of my office uh, showing, but uh, let's just say I love sports. I'm a huge sports enthusiast. Um, a, uh, leisure, a leisurely weekend event for me would be a nice, short, relaxing 50, 75 mile bike ride. Um, 
It, those are just the leisure ones. That's not my races. My races are 100 to 200 mile bike rides. Um, but anyways, so that is what I love to do. I'm, I love endurance sports. I love getting out there in nature. The cool thing about adaptive sports for me is that because we are blind, we don't do sports as an individual. It's no longer about an I. It's a team. It's a team effort. And that is the fun part of sports is that one thing that I've looked at as a, you know, person that was formerly cited that was doing a lot of running and other things is that it was boring beyond all belief to be out there running, training all by yourself. But with my visual impairment, um, the community that I have developed, the friends that I have made. And just so many opportunities that have come up over my lifetime because of the folks that I've met with, because of my visual impairment, because of my hobbies, it's been incredible. Some of the folks that I have met, it's, it's a reward all onto its own. Where have you traveled with your guide dog? So with my guide dog, I've traveled everywhere in the continental United States. Part of uh, one of my jobs before uh, where I was today is that I was kind of doing traveling sales. And so as a totally blind guy traveling around the country, hitting up the airport, you know, beauty part about living in Kansas City is the MCI airport is a beautiful, fun airport to get in and out of really quickly. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's fun just being able to travel, just being able to go everywhere and anywhere. I've not gone overseas. Uh, with my guide dog, I've gone overseas when I, uh, before I got my guide dog where I've been over to Europe and Asia, uh, just using my cane. And there's kind of some interesting things that I've learned and uh, witnessed with cane travel in other countries. But yeah, it's definitely been fun to travel just in new cities, big ones, you know, your DCs, your San Francisco's, your Seattle's and New York's of the world to, uh, you know, small rural ones, um, you know, most of Kansas, I've been to a lot, a lot of the cities, a lot of major cities uh, here throughout Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, um, Illinois, Wisconsin, um, and so many other areas. Uh, and it's just, it, it's been fun to travel. And th this is where it's, uh, I'll, I have my preference going back to that, why it's like, you know, I, I view the guide dog as one that works best for me is the way that I travel, the way that I interact with the world, that's been the one that's worked the best for me in those situations. Um, to do that much and that type of travel. So um, now uh, related to cane travel, uh, what was the question about the, uh, the smart cane? Yeah, I can read it from the chat. So there's a design team at WSU working on something that's currently being called a smart cane. Um, have you heard anything about it? Uh, there are several iterations I had several design teams of that one. I am not particularly uh, uh, familiar with what the folks at WSU might be developing. A uh, buddy of mine, when I was working out in Palo Alto, uh, named Brian Higgins, he was creating uh, a smart cane that was using LIDAR, as well as I was able to test out the uh, smart cane that the individual in um, India was developing and a couple others out there. And with those, my overall impressions of those is you better have some good cane, non-smart cane skills first, because <laughs> they are not going to answer and they're not going to make the world more open for you if you don't know how to use a basic cane first. Um, because you first, I mean, the cool thing about the smart canes is, okay, they got some uh, sonars or LIDAR, depending on what sensor uh, package they're using to be able to say what's above you, what's at your waist and what might be at your left and right. So then you're not getting that wonderful, hey, look, that branch has got me right in the forehead again, rats. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it would be interesting to just see what theirs are, how they're developing, what, what some of the designs, um, especially if they're gonna be having it uh, synchronized with an iOS app or an Android app, like some of them are looking at because there is some good practical usage for smart cane, as I said, being able to detect what's above your head because there's only so many of us that likes to wear a hat in every situation. And, and there's only so many times that uh, we can tell people that will walk around, 
why do we got our hand out at our forehead level with our fingers spread, trying to feel for a branch? I mean, it, that, that looks that the optics on that, it's it's it gets old quickly. So that's where some of that would be really cool to see how they're going to uh, address some of those things. And more importantly, the weight. Um, I got my, my hands and wrists and everything. They're not the greatest anymore. So that's uh, another situation of how much does it weigh? A one pound device in all day usage only goes so far. So there, there's my smart cane critique. Um, and I think there was another question about bikes. Yeah, there's one more. I have a question for my co-host, Gabe. Do you ever bike 50 miles? I do not. On your days off? Okay. I don't either, so. That is a day off. <laughs> uh, the question comes from Anna. Do you ride a bike independently or use a tandem or some other option? I am a tandem rider. Um, though a friend of mine, um, Sean Chessar, um, she is a totally blind um, athlete. She did ride across the country, uh, going from West Coast to East Coast, as well as going down the Continental Divide Trail, which starts up on the Canada border up in Montana, down to the Mexico border, down in, um, I want to say it's either New Mexico or Arizona. Wow. Um, but she did it on a single um, with a uh, guide in front of her. That is crazy. Wow. So check her out, Sean Shassire. Don't ask me to spell her name. Um, <laughs> yeah. Really cool. She just finished the uh, the Continental Divide uh, in uh, July. Next year, for fun, she's doing Everest. So Everest? there's some cool things that blind folks are doing. There's one other question um, in the chat, if you're up for it, Tim. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, wow. Do you have apps you use when you travel to unfamiliar areas? Yes, my go-to um, app in unfamiliar areas is going to be Ira. Thank you very much for posting Sean's website. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Yeah, no, my, my go-to solution, uh, seriously, it is, it is Ira when traveling uh, very unfamiliar areas. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I actually just did start using with the rollout of iOS 16, mm -hmm is going to be that people and door detection feature located in the magnifier app. That I have found to be really cool and sweet to use uh, because you know getting, getting two places is not the hard part. It's the last 30 feet that we travel that's hard. And so I found like that to be very useful in unfamiliar areas where Barney does not know what door I'm trying to hit or where the door is because a a wall of glass looks the same to Barney, but the app is able to pick up that door in that wall of glass. So it's, yeah, there, there's some really cool tools out there. Um, uh, Scene AI, I also love using um, for its uh, LiDAR features to detect objects nearby, as well as um, uh, Blind Square uh, Super Sense um, and some of those other ones while traveling. Can you? Um... Please tell me what that door detection app was. Okay, so door detection is a feature located in the magnifier app that is a part of you know your iPhones and your iPads. And so with that, um, there's some options for being able to detect ob um, obstacle or detect objects. Uh, the ob the objects it detects is going to be people and doors. And it's also able to do some using the uh, normal voiceover uh, image uh, recognition. It also does a pretty good job with just you know voiceover recognizing what's in the image. But it's part of the default iOS 16 magnifier app. So curious, has anyone in the room here used that by show of hands? Um, I've heard about it, but I've never actually checked it out myself. I've heard about it just now, and I have to agree. With, I have to agree with Kate on this one. I've never heard of it just now. Yeah, yeah, okay, we've got I've some. <laughs> heard, but never used, so that's, that's awesome. Um, Gabe, do you have any other questions for? I do, I have one more. Yeah, go for it. Whenever you receive any unwanted assistance, what do you do about that or anything in that? Uh, next? This, is, this is a fun one that I know we all get. It's the, 
Um, unwanted assistance. Uh, I like, and I like to call some of the situations like little microaggression situations that we encounter as individuals with visual impairments. And it's how are we able to tell a person, thank you for thinking about me and trying to offer us assistance when it's not really wanted. And while also telling them, it's like, you're also belittling my skill sets as an individual with a visual impairment that's been, you know, I'm trained and fully capable of interacting with the world. Thank you very much. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a hard thing. So I say one of the harder ones is going to be when I am sitting there trying to cross over a, uh, a, a street that's, um, you know, it might be one of the busier streets and I'll have someone come up and say, well, that's if they say anything. Sometimes they just grab my arm and start to usher me across the street with Barney in tow. And it's like, yo, come on, dude, back off. Um, it's like the best thing that we, the best thing that I can do is one thing in those situations. I just learn how to do a nice little arm shoulder roll that allows my arm to disengage from their grasp. Um, and that allows me then to take a step back and say, thank you before you approach and do that again, please introduce yourself to me. Let me know who you are. Otherwise I don't know who you are, what you're trying to do. I'm just being pushed and, uh, and pulled to where I don't know. So it's being able to just quickly say, well, th thank you, but um, I'm okay. Who are you? And uh, what are you trying to do? And trying to say that in a nice way, it's just one of, the, one of the things, the only things that I can do. Now, I do base my tone and everything based on the individual. So some like our older adults that I might be encountering, um, because I've often found that older adults, you know, grandparents, great grandparents, age type folks, they try to do this. And with them, I'm a whole lot gentler because it's like, oh, thank you for trying to help, but I'm good. Um, for some folks that's a little bit more abrasive and aggressive with how they're trying to assist, that's where, you know, I just, it's our safety at stake. And that's where I'll definitely make sure to take a step back and just have a little good, safe, uh, personal bubble to go and say, who are you? What are you trying to do? While also, also trying to use that situation as a way of educating them by saying, I know where I'm at. If you see that, um, if you see the uh, curb cut with the little bumpies down there, that allows me to orientate myself for the intersection. See that street sign, see how it has a little uh, button on it? That button has an arrow. That's how I know the direction I need to travel. So it's using those moments to provide education based on what situation it is. But that does happen. And it's how do you use it to say, thanks, but no, keep yourself safe, and then educate. Teachable moments, teachable moments. That's great. Thank you for that answer. There's two more questions in the chat. Um, Gabe, did you have any other questions? That was my last one. That was, okay, cool. So um, I can start going over the questions in the chat, but I'm curious to you if anybody sure. in our room here has them. Okay, so we have two questions in the room. If, um, okay. You all can hold on just a sec. We'll go to the chat, one of the chats first. So um for era ira i think i'm mispronouncing that sorry um do you use a cell phone lanyard when traveling since they don't sell the glasses anymore uh no so what i do is i hold the phone with my hand on my chest as a way of just positioning it because um if someone were to provide y'all with some uh, descriptive feedback on the way i'm presenting is even though i can't see I am a hand gesture person that no matter what I'm talking, what I'm doing, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm using my hands, but um, so I'm, I'm even that way when I'm using IRA with my phone, because that's actually the way that I am communicating, interacting with the person is that, you know, I'm showing them around. I'm saying, because usually I know roughly where I need to go. I just need just that little nudging uh, which direction. So I'm, I'm holding in my hand and just navigating things. And also it's a way of me being able to keep the center because with a guide dog, okay, center of your chest is not always the center of your overall person because the guide dog is going to add another 
two and a half feet on my left. And for those agents, sometimes it's like they need to be more in the center. So I'll hold my phone more over toward my shoulder. Um, if you ever want a funny thing, uh, one of the funniest descriptions you could get is me using the IRA with my phone while shopping, using a shopping cart and a guide dog. Oh my uh, the only thing I'm going to say is uh, I'm using pinkies, index fingers, and a whole lot of other things in a whole lot of different positions that otherwise is quite comical to watch, but it works for me. <laughs> it works for you. It works for you. That's good. That's important. Um, can we get a question from the room here? So what do you do when you encounter a strength that does not have any truncated downs? Hope for the best. I, I know my comms people are are cringing at that comment, but um, uh, you, you just kind of have to stay put for a minute to really get an understanding of what that street is like. Because there's a lot of T intersections and other, especially if there's uh, construction going on, you're not going to get truncated domes or bumpies, I like to call them, um, at points when you've got a, um, a construction sign or a construction barrier blockading that sidewalk or streets or anything. So it comes down to spending the time, being patient, listening, figuring out what's around you, what's going to be safe, and sometimes asking for assistance maybe taking a little bit longer away, going down a different street. Um, or as I said, I don't want to say hope for the best, but sometimes it's, uh, okay, I don't think um, any, anyone's coming. I'm using all my right, uh, all my right skill sets that my uh, orientation person taught me. Um, here goes. And it's all, it's all we can do is just, Make sure we're using that which we know and being patient. Go ahead, one more. My next question is, do you ever use your phone to like detect what's on the shelves in stores? All the time. All the time. It's How does that work? It depends what you're shopping for. It's going to be the biggest thing. Boxes are a whole lot easier than round objects. And mm -hmm. definitely both of those are a whole lot easier than me trying to shop for dog food when all the bags of food are lying, you know, long ways and there's really not a whole lot. So you figure out, oh, wait, they got the dog food laying down. Let me, um, uh, so it's, and that's where just the whole variety of apps that's available out there on the market comes on to play is that, um, yeah, I've used seen, seen AI and SuperSense before to just kind of figure out what's generally around me by reading off just some of the uh, objects um, and products. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'll be using IRA, which is a little bit easier. And then, you know, part of the time, if I can't definitely find it, uh, it's me going and finding anyone that might be around me and say, hey, can you help me find a yogurt or can you help me find? And most people usually have no problem with that. I usually say it's their customer service <laughs> or can someone help me? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tavy. Appreciate you. Um, there's one in the chat, and folks online, if you have questions now, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, one is, what computer skills do you feel are essential as an adult? Troubleshooting. Troubleshooting. Ah. I do have to agree with what you said. Troubleshooting is a big issue that you have to know how to, because if you get into it, you have to know how to get out of it as well. Because troubleshooting can be like, what if, what if an error pops up on your computer or something like that, or something that you don't know how to fix. Mm -hmm. So like, if you don't know how to fix it, what are you going to do? Do you just throw the computer out? No, you don't. Yes. You figure out a way that you can fix it on yourself or go to the manufacturer where you got it from and have them help you. That's ideally, what I would say. Ideally, not throwing the computer out, right? Tim, did you want to? Um, no, that's you, you nailed it right there. Because that, that's why you just you need it, you're, you don't need to be your own tech support team, but you do need to know how to contact them and th and that's just what troubleshooting is it's how can you back yourself out of where you are yes mm -hmm. yeah that's the important part i think as well 
uh, I mean, as one who does a lot of troubleshooting from my own technology and other people's, that's like the biggest thing is either knowing how to fix it, knowing how to research to fix it, or knowing who to ask, I feel like. Process of elimination with tech, right? <laughs> uh, there's one other question in the room. So um, give us just a sec. We'll have our student come on up. This is cool so far. Yeah. Hi, Miss Maddie. Okay. I'm going to put your hand on the table and like, sorry. Go ahead, girl genius. So, if you've been using your cane for your whole life, do you think you should switch if you're thinking about switching from a cane to a guide dog? You could call up one of the uh, one of the main uh, guide dog schools because. In all of our areas, like even here in Kansas City, uh, they'll have a uh, one of their uh, their field service trainers type folks, and you could reach out, talk to them, see if they if they might have a guide dog around that you could just yeah, I want to call it demoing, but it's but it's just when you just get that good first like feel on it's like so this is a guide dog this is this is how it. It's that that would be one way of just being able to feel out. If you're going to one of the uh, major uh, major um, associations, uh, conventions, or regional things, um, usually there's going to be at least one guide dog user there. Ask them uh, because it's one thing just to hear about it in this type of setting and do the education. It's another thing to be able to actually get a feel. And I'm I'm a hands-on. Technically, I'm a visual learner, but well, visual learning is a little bit different when you have to do everything hands on. So that's where it's like I needed practical application. So uh, before I started using the guide dog, I I got to the point where I loved my cane. I was using my cane all the time. Um, you know, drop me off anywhere, absolutely no problem. Big huge uh, cement field with a whole lot of stuff in it. I had no problem getting in and through it. But um, I was at a I was at a conference and a friend of mine was like, you know, with, with the speed that you walk, with the way that you walk, you ever consider a dog? I'm like, oh no, it doesn't really interest me. I got dogs at home, but they're great pets. And then they're like, here, let's go ahead, demo, uh, just have you try out this dog just to go around the block. Um, and it, this was with an actual trainer. And so it's like, you know, we, did the walk around the block and that's how uh, I fell personally fell in love with dogs is because of that experience. So it's, if you could make that situation happen, use that to make that choice if it's for you or maybe not quite yet, or maybe not at all. Sounds like an important <laughs> decision, but one that has a lot of different factors to it. Yes. Absolutely. Worst comes to worst, you take one of your orientation mobility people, pop a harness on them, and you know. Oh, no. Seriously, that that, that, Wait, that actually what's is happening? the initial training at, at most guide dog schools. Is the purse the tr your trainer, the human trainer, not the dog, um, will have the harness, and they're going to be pulling you around as a way of being able to simulate a guide dog. So as much as it sounds funny, that actually is part of the course. So. <laughs> The more you know. Okay, just, yeah. um, one more question in the chat, if you've got time at the close, but do you use an Amazon device? And if you do, does voice view work efficiently? It works good enough to be able to interact with, um, with the Echo Shows. Um, it's, it's a bit difficult to type with voice view um on like the shows but it is able to work good enough for you to be able to find things interact with the settings overall um i i don't use voice view that much because uh I'm trying to give a good way of describing it the the sensitivity it's if you're used to using the i uh, the iphone or the ipad you're talking about basically the top level of gesture engagements for a visually impaired individual. Androids are 
very, very, very close to where iPhones are with being able to send and receive our, our gestures using TalkBack. Voice view is a few steps below both of them, which is why it's, it works, you can use it. it. It just might not be the most accurate thing. And I've been using voice view now for about a year. So it's, it's possible, but it's, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 It okay. works. Good feedback. Good feedback. Is there any more questions in the room that we have here on campus? Any any other questions from our folks online? Sure. I have a question. <clears throat> um, can I get more contact info? I'd be very interested to like send emails back and forth or something. Sure. Go for it. Um let me know if you're ready. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, Leah and everyone, they, they have it and they can send it. Well, either one works. If I can type your email right now or whatever, if you wish. Okay, I'll give it to you. Um, it is T-H-O-R-N-I-K mm -hmm. at B-V-A dot O-R-G. Cool. I'll add that. Thanks. No problem. What do you think, Gabe? Any final thoughts? It's a really good presentation by him. Speechless. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the audience. Who's going to sign up for uh, blind soccer? Oh, God. Oh, a couple hands up here. A lot of reaction. Couple hands. <laughs> I have one final question. Could you just share a little about what you do professionally with the Blinded Veterans Association? Oh, that's very good. Oh, rats. Um, I know. Like a quick, quick time, but just a snippet. No, what I what I do is my my program is one that I've developed within the organization. It's focused on around three peers, which is one I do technology testing, evaluation, and training. So I have a uh, weekly um, uh, webinar series that's uh, available. That's uh, thanks to our sponsors, folks like Orcam and uh, Despero and Freedom Scientific. So we have them on. Uh, second phase of what I do is going to be a lot, a lot of things that's research based. So, uh, with the research I'm referring to, um, I'm engaged with the, uh, the, the Department of Veterans Affairs inpatient and outpatient uh, blind rehab folks. And so I go around to those entities to conduct uh, reviews, not, not just reviews, but kind of overall assessments. And I'm in the process of developing a research team so we can actually do some hardcore, like actual research research. Uh, with those types of entities to see um, outcomes, not just satisfaction, but you know what works, how do they work, all that good type of stuff. And then the uh, third pillar of what I do is uh, Section 508 testing, as well as working with the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs 508 team as a uh, external uh, um, nonprofit group that's advocating for uh, Section 508. Um, accessibility and usability within federal entities. And I'm just gonna say that part of what I do is very, very interesting. There it is. In a, in a nutshell, right? <laughs> yes. Basically. Basically. Cool. Well, can we get a big round of applause for Tim? Yeah. 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 I get feedback in the chat too. Tim, thank you so no much problem. for our White Cane Day week. And Saturday will be here before we know it. So. Oh, yeah. Oh. Not that school's not important, no. but <laughs> we know it's White Cane Day 2022. And we thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in across Kansas and yeah. wherever else you might be. And Tim, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all very much and have a good day and make sure to actually go and check out KSA 39-1104. <laughs> the logo for the Kansas State School for the Blind, Fade to Black.